Giant sunflowers. Giant sunflowers. Russian mammoth sunflowers. There you go, Russian look. mammoth. There you go. I actually have a picture, I think, of in this exact field. I was actually standing out in it with my hand straight above my head as far as I could reach, and all you could see was my fingertips. It was pretty cool. Was this, this some you were growing in Colorado there? Yeah. Yeah, they were probably the best sunflowers we ever grew. Yeah, that's impressive. We get too much rain here for that. Is that what the theory is? Yeah. <clears throat> Sunflower disease. <laughs> John, doesn't that sound like a terrible problem to have? Yeah, yeah, it's a different problem to have for sure. <laughs> yeah. So before we get started, I guess where I'm not super familiar, I guess, either with where Jeff's at or where John's at. Um, I guess, John, you're in Colorado, is that correct? Yeah, up on the northeast corner. Okay. We get about 17 inches of annual rainfall. And how about you, uh, Jeff? Uh, I'm northeast Nebraska. We get about 28 inches. And uh, my growing zone is more like southern South Dakota, more than Nebraska. Okay. Welcome, Jordan. I might, uh, we're getting just a little bit of tractor noise. I might mute you until you're ready, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm getting to the end. I just finished my field. So. You're good. Shut her down in a minute. I hey, Noah, I'm going to... Gonna... Noah, I'm going to go dark here, and I'll be answering questions off in the chat. Okay. We might... Uh might pull you in for just a couple of them but yeah yeah that's fine that's fine i'm going to go ahead and start sharing this live on facebook Jordan's got the best background of everybody. I'm jealous. <laughs> if I turn around, it's a disc field. <laughs> I started farming, so I had to disc it, but I'll hide that. There you go. see all right i think we got everybody here so i'll just wait another probably minute and we'll go ahead and get started thanks guys for taking a break from planting it's it's hard because it was probably the worst time to try and get a, a panelist together of farmers but it's also the best time because everybody's kind of thinking about it so we do appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to help us out Yeah, thank, thanks for asking me. It's the most people I've seen in a, in a long time. <laughs> Social distancing a part of your everyday life, John? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even when I you find, go to town, you might only see two people, so. I find that my personality kind of is an automatic social distancer yeah. Yeah. yeah likewise all right well we'll go ahead and get started here um first just kind of go over the ground rules again i know we do this every week but all the attendees are, are going to be muted at this point if you guys have questions you can go ahead and type them out in the chat bar on the side keith is um, with us he'll be answering those as they come in otherwise you can wait uh, until the end and what's called raise your hand and we'll go ahead and let you ask your question live if you want to do that. Um, this week's a little bit different. We've been doing a couple of presentation type webinars this week. We wanted to switch focus a little bit as we've seen 
a shift in the economy, obviously with um, farm prices the way they are with the commodities and, and inputs don't seem to be going down respectively. So we are just noticing a, an interest, I guess, in growing other crops, alternative to corn and beans and even soybeans and um, wheat and cotton. So we got a panelist here of producers that have grown or at least tried to grow a couple different things. So wanted to get their input and answer your guys' questions on some of the challenges that face um, growing alternative crops. So I guess just to start off, I don't have any biographies or anything on you guys, but we'll start here with John. Why don't you go ahead and just kind of tell us um, where you're located and what kind of crops you grow at your farm. Um, I'm John Herman. I'm from Haxton, Colorado. It's the northeast corner. Um, we get about 17 inches of rainfall. Um, in my past, like 10 years ago, um, all we were growing was uh, wheat and some millet and doing a lot of summer fallow. But the last oh, five to eight years kind of diversified a lot. Um, so I've grown a number of things for you know, the seed market or specialty markets. Um, so now I, like right now, I got rye growing with hairy vetch and I have some winter peas growing with winter wheat. Um, I'm about to plant chickpeas with flax. Um, I have some woolly pod vetch growing with yellow peas. Um, I'll be planting some uh, myelo with some companions and I have some uh, cover crops already seeded some early spring season cover crops for grazing and I'll also be seeding some uh, warm season cover crops here shortly for grazing. Um, I've also, uh, what else have I grown? I grow some millets. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of all I can think about that I've, I've grown right now. Okay. Does that kind of um, cover it? I've been trying to get into more companion crops and kind of growing more more than one thing at one time. Sure. Uh, next, we've got Jeff Stefan. And Jeff, why don't you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself and what crops you grow? Yeah, I'm Jeff Stefan. Uh, I'm from Northeast Nebraska. Um, we get about 28 inches. Um, so it's traditional corn soybean area. Um, there is some livestock though. So uh, uh, alternative crops I'm growing, you know, with cover crops is uh, growing multi-species cover crops for grazing. Um, we're corn and soybeans, but also uh, I've always grown a lot of oats. Um, I work with South, South Dakota State on, on their newer varieties. And uh, even though my oats is all grown for seed, um, I am interested in uh, demonstrating how we can use the milling market here. Uh, grain millers um, is in our area uh, as far as the possibility for marketing oats that way. Um, also have some companion crops this year. I have some uh, winter rye and winter peas. Uh, I plan to take the harvest. Um, and for the guy that doesn't want too much adventure, our best alternate crop right now is non-GMO soybeans. Um, I work with Iowa State. Uh, I get their foundation seed and uh, um, we sell uh, non-GMO soybeans for over, over the board, uh, 25, 20, 25 cents over the board. And uh, it goes up to a soybean processor in South Dakota for non-GMO soybean meal. And I'm also growing some high protein, large seeded, uh, uh, food grade soybeans uh, from Iowa State Genetics. That I am still working on the market. So I think you're supposed to do that opposite, market first, then grow it. But I got some for seed now. So uh, so that's some of the things I'm working on now. Perfect. Uh, I'll have a question for you here coming up, designed exactly around that. Uh, next up, we've got Jordan Carlson. Go ahead and yeah, it looks like you got, did you finish planting all your beans today? I finished a field as, as we got started here, but I have more to go. Um, yeah, I'm from Callaway, Nebraska. Um, 
and right in central Nebraska, basically. Um, it's corn and soybean area, and that's primarily uh, what we do is corn and soybeans um, with irrigated, um, probably 80% irrigation uh, where we farm. So, um, yeah, what I started doing basically as soon as I started farming uh, 10, 11 years ago uh, was yellow field peas, and that, that led to other things. Um, like multi-species cover crops with, as a, you know, with an extra opportunity ap after uh, pea harvest, um, you know, gave us that opportunity to do that. Um, since then, been doing more oats, uh, rye, vetch, uh, even some buckwheat here and there, and um, some other things that we're just dabbling around with growing together, sometimes just for our own cover crop seed um, that you know, that we can use on our own farm. Uh, we're using probably 3,000 bushel of rye uh, just to cover our corn and bean acres in the fall. So we'll grow our own and grow uh, more for either neighbors or just wholesale seed market, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's the gist of it, I guess. Okay. We also have uh, Scott Ravencamp on, and he is our contract grower manager. So we wanted to have some of his insight from the actual marketing side. He is in charge of all of our contract acres of green cover seed and actually acquiring the, the cover crop seed. So we wanted his input. Scott, um, why don't you give a little bit of background about yourself? So uh, before I started working for green cover, I farmed for about 25 years in Eastern Colorado, was probably actually close to being a neighbor of John's. Um, I don't know, it was about 100, 150 miles from him. So when I started farming, just like John, it was traditionally a wheat fallow area. We transitioned over to, uh, to where when we quit farming, we was not growing any of the crops that we were growing when I'd started farming. Um, all the crops we were raising when we quit farming in eastern Colorado was stuff we were not growing when I started. So it was quite the transition over 25 years. Um, my wife and I just decided we needed a change of pace in life. Moved up to northeast Nebraska, now a neighbor of Jeff's. So got two, two neighbors on one, one webinar here tonight. Um, yeah, so when it comes to these specialty crops, that's what Jeff touched on it. You kind of need the market is probably one of the biggest things. And even when we were in Colorado, that's what we found. We, the marketing was a big part of whatever we grew. It, it isn't typically something that you can just haul into the local elevator and get a check that afternoon. You kind of need to have a plan on what you're going to do with it and where to go with it. So that, that's probably the biggest thing I have to add here is, you know, whatever it is you're going to grow, you, you kind of need to have a, a plan on what you're going to do with it and how to handle it. It's just, that's the biggest change you'll face when you just can't haul it into the elevator and get a check for it. Yeah. And then rounding up our panelists, we've got uh, Dale Strickler, who's done several of our webinars here. He's our sales agronomist. So we kind of brought him on board for the agronomy side of things. And we also have Keith who will be answering some of the questions here on the, the side chat. So just to kick things off, um, I guess what for each of you was your, I say breaking point, but more like your inspiration for trying to grow other things. Is it something that your parents did or was there a moment for you where you decided I'm gonna try something different? And we'll start uh, with Jordan here. Okay, I don't. I wouldn't say was, there was a breaking point. I mean, I, I started um, with yellow field peas. And I, I think that idea probably came from Dwayne Beck up at Dakota Lakes. Um, my dad had tried it maybe a year or two before I got back and it didn't actually go very well. Um, but for some reason, when I started, I, I thought I would try it and put it on probably more acres than I should. And, and there, the guys are right. I mean, you need a market before you start, but that wasn't the way I went about it. I just planted them because I wanted better wheat or better corn the next year. And um, that I think that was about as much thought as I put into it at the time. And I think that's a good thing. It turned out good that that's the way I did it, or I probably wouldn't have done it. 
Um, and I, and I had a lot of beginner's luck. I had a great crop, but the marketing thing was what ended up being what was tough. Um, we, I ended up having to haul them, uh, probably five hours, um, up into South Dakota and it, it all worked out, uh, because I had a good crop. Um, but you know, that I wouldn't say there was, there was a breaking point necessarily. I think all along for me, the reason to do an alternative crop or a specialty crop or whatever has usually been, um, something I want to do in my field. I want diversity. Um, I want, um, the following crop, um, to benefit. And then from trying different things, then I've seen other opportunities and ways, ways to do that. So that's been my motivation in alternative crops. Um, I wish I could say that it was, uh, Hey, I saw a better, uh, money-making opportunity every time. Uh, once in a while that's happened. Um, but usually it's been looking at, uh, the soil and, um, the crop rotation and seeing something that I wanted to accomplish there and then finding a market or finding a way that I could do it. Um, a lot of times I say finding a way I can afford to rotate or afford to try an alternative crop. Um, so that, that's it for me. Yeah. Jeff, would you say you've had a similar experience or what was it like in your situation? You know, I'll, I kind of blame it on, I went through the eighties <laughs> and, and barely made it through the eighties. And then, uh, um, you know, when you're in trouble, it's too late to try different things. So during the commodity boom times, you know, we kind of faded out of raising hogs and I started, that's when I started looking into alternative markets for alternative crops, I guess, uh, I just figured like the eighties when times are really good, that means at some point times are going to get worse. So I think that's what led me more to this more than anything. And then, um, interest in conservation, um, well health kind of, kind of helped it too, but. Yeah. Uh, John, how about yourself? Well, out, out here in Colorado, they, in my area, they kind of only grow, a lot of guys would still just grow wheat and I don't, I just felt like I grew up in the mindset, like that's all you could grow. But then when you go to some of these conferences or talk to other growers, um, they kind of opens your eyes that there's a lot of things out there that you uh, can grow. And to me, the, the challenge of growing something new and, and learning something uh, different is, is kind of fun. And along those same lines, when you, you know, just start running the numbers and, and trying to cash flow some of these common crops that you just haul to the elevator. Stuff doesn't always pencil out very good. So if, if you can find another market and something that's a, a better revenue stream or, or something that you're willing to do, then, then that helps the whole farm. And with one of the things I really like about growing these different things too, is it spreads out my workload throughout the year. You know, I'm not out there in the tractor and drill drilling wheat for three weeks and then in the combine for three weeks during the summer and then you're always busy at the you know you're always overloaded and trying to get the same crops done at the the same time so I've, I've really like growing some of these different things and I'm not you know I'm I'm busy but it's a it's a staggered busy and kind of just a constant flow and I'm not out there in the combine for weeks on end you know it kind of staggers throughout the year so I, I kind of like that too yeah um okay for you guys you, you all touched on markets so i kind of want to get that over with here what what did you guys do to market these products and obviously some of you guys said that you grew it first and then found the market but how are you guys finding those markets uh, what what innovative ways have you guys marketed that product Am I up first? We'll let you start, yep. Okay. <laughs> um, who's up? Yeah, I'll let you start, John. Okay. Um, 
you know, so you know, there's some other elevators around my area, like the Redwood Group. They've been taking some specialty stuff, like flax and chickpeas and some of the yellow peas um, and some of the other things like that. So they've kind of opened up a, a little bit of a local market, and you know, that one was kind of already here, just starting, and they were kind of searching for growers. So that one kind of came upon me. Um, as far as the other ones, you know, just kind of asking the looking around at some of the farmers who are planting, you know, cover crops, what what are they needing seed for? If if they're needing rye or some peas or something like that, you know, you can always look in your local area and, and see where they're getting their seed from or and then just reaching out to some of the seed growers and, and seeing you know, people like Scott uh, and asking them, you know, what do you need grow grown or what what do you want dried and then just trying to build a good relationship and grow it you know, high quality weed seed and high germ products will will get you a long ways too, I think. And I think doing it, you know, if you're farming in a regenerative way or using cover crop practices and, and you know, farming a little bit different, it, it helps the quality of, of your product as well. Yeah. How about you, uh, Jordan? Yeah, I'd say uh, it's been pretty similar for me. Um, you know, starting with peas, uh, um, went ahead and invested in, in seed cleaning equipment and went into certified um, seed uh, there. And that market for us is, you know, it went from I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't find a, a place to go, you know, closer than five hours away to, you know, now we have close markets, but our, our uh, you know, the commodity pea prices dropped a fair bit with tariffs from India and just everything else going on in commodities. But um, so some of that's tapered off, but um, the same thing uh, to some degree, uh, finding seed markets, things that we need and other, you know, um, cover crop growers need um, in the seed market has been, a, has been a, probably the biggest one. Um, we did look at opportunities to sell, um, you know, buckwheat to Japan and I mean, the green cover was, uh, in on that with us, but there just was some uncertainty there that we didn't want to deal with. So we decided to, uh, shy away from that. Um, but that's been it. I mean, uh, really that if I had, you know, we talked earlier today, like Scott and I, that it, you know, if I could grow a thousand acres of oats and be profitable with it, I would love to. It'd be great. You know, I could do a lot of things for my soil uh, and I could do a lot of things after that crop. But um, really for me, marketing has been a challenge, but it's, it's something that I'm willing to put the effort into marketing because um, I um, don't like hauling yellow corn to the elevator and, and just, you know, barely getting by. Um, so. I found that when I do grow an alternative crop or, or grow, um, have a good rotation with cover crop in it, I can, um, on the other hand, grow yellow corn or soybeans uh, uh, more profitably with less cost. Uh, it's not dramatic and it's sometimes hard to pick out, but when you start looking at it, it's like, well, I didn't have the, the pest challenges that I used to have, or I, you know, I didn't have the fertilizer input that I would have had had I just done corn on corn. So even within the commodity crops that we're, you know, we're growing um, some food grade white corn, uh, popcorn, things like that. So um, even within that, we're just trying to diversify a little bit. So um, I found that even in, I'm not very good at commodity marketing. And I, you know, I don't know a lot of people who really are consistently for me, it's taken the pressure off of that. If I can take some acres um, and or bushels or however you want to look at it and have something else to market um, that might might be, uh, you know, more profitable when corn isn't or, you know, vice versa. I've seen that. That's just added a little bit of stability for me. Diversifying. Yeah. 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 How about you, Jeff? Yeah, like uh, like Jordan and John, I you know similar uh, with uh, 
um, you know, I started with uh, growing, I was growing oats that we had a local market. Um, and I would always research, go to the universities and look for the better seeds. And then pretty soon your neighbors want some. And that's basically how I accidentally got into crop improvement and growing seed uh, from the legal standpoint of view. Um, so our local market has basically gone away on oats. Um, the elevator, nearby elevators don't take oats anymore. But in the last couple of years, um, like grain millers has actually came to Yankton, South Dakota uh promoting oats you know um and somewhat of a niche market um our oats is a little earlier ready a little bit earlier than when they get it down from canada or, or north dakota um if we can get the specs um i, I say uh you know a, about a third of my crops are specialty probably niche market you'd call them but i spend two-thirds of my time on them <laughs> so there's a little bit of work in there but there's a margin um, and you know that, that's that's the main thing a margin is better than no margin so uh, uh, the soybeans um, beans I was raising seed that's I got the interest in the genetics first and then I accidentally found out we had a local market for it so uh, uh, I run them in test plots with my best local soybeans with enlist and, and roundup ready and uh, uh, we're getting similar yields and and no tilling was no was no big deal um, I was no tilling soybeans before there was roundup ready beans so I just kind of went back to the way I was doing it as far as that goes um, but yeah the, some of those markets kind of just fell in fell in in uh, after I got the interest in growing it I guess but it's kind of how it works. Yeah. Jordan, you had mentioned earlier, you were just talking about the, the cleaning equipment. I guess for you guys, what are some of the challenges or purchases you guys had to make when it comes to the equipment of growing these crops? Or did you fit the crop to, to fit the equipment that you had? And why don't you start with that, Jordan? Well, um, so, you know, so far we've been able to as far as planting and harvest pretty much get by with what we had i mean i've made a bigger investment um you know in, in drilling equipment but that's partially because we're going to uh, cover a lot of acres with cover crop too um so that's something we may not have had um you know there was a little bit of harvest equipment for the peas at that time um but yeah it's significant amount of money and um, seed cleaning equipment um, but that to me has just created more opportunities things I can do for myself that I wouldn't have been able to and uh, sometimes just you know wholesale markets I can get into um, you know since I have that kind of under my belt already um, but it, it also is a lot of work <laughs> and it's not fun work a lot of the time um, but like Jeff said, it's, sometimes when you're you're working hard and it's it's extra work and you're spending your time on those niche things, it, it's at least if you can say, hey, there was a uh, margin in it <laughs> at the end. That that's encouraging, especially at a time when you sometimes can't pencil a margin on your commodity crops, and that that kind of takes the edge off of the work on some of those days. How about you, Jeff? As in? For, for your harvest and planting equipment, did you have to make a lot of changes for that? Oh, uh, you know, we always had a drill. I, I probably, you know, ended up buying a better drill, you know, um, as far as no-till drilling goes, but we always had a drill. We always had, you know, uh, probably the seed cleaning equipment would be the one thing uh, like Jordan says and it gives you so much flexibility on what you can do uh, I can harvest a companion crop and, and separate them and you know do things like that and uh, you know that gives you something you can market over it, it would be tough if I didn't have it sitting there um, 
you basically it's really tough to find somebody to clean seed for you so um other than that i have it's pretty general equipment um i do i do own my own self-propelled sprayer and, and that's a huge thing when you have a, a lot of multi-crops because it's a lot of specialty type you know mixes you're coming up with so okay how about you john um, as far as my equipment, I tried to kind of grow things and, and keep the same equipment that I had that I was already using for crops that I was growing before, such as weed and, and millet. So uh, all the specialty crops I plant, I still use my same drill and still use the same harvest equipment. I had a Shelbourne already, Shelbourne stripper head. So I, I use that for a lot of the crops that you know maybe aren't conventionally uh, combine with the stripper head but they, they seem to work all right with it so I guess the one thing that um, equipment wise or something you don't think about is storage because um, a lot of time you aren't bought, you aren't growing a tremendous amount of acres of these specialty crops so you need in my experience you need a lot of smaller bin storage as opposed to the you know large bin storage of one single crop because then you're and you have all these, you know, four or five bins of a quarter or something full of full of something different. So that that's kind of been a challenge, but and something I didn't, you know, didn't think about. But then you get a combine, and you think, oh, where am I going to put this now? So, yeah. And yeah, also also the cleaning equipment too. But I mean, that's that's opened up a, a lot of different things, like the previous guys were saying too. Sure. And so, it seems like so, you know. Yeah, go ahead. You could, it is hard to find someone to, to clean the stuff. And so you, you're kind of almost forced to, to buy your own stuff and, and do it yourself, especially doing inner crops or, or companion crops. I mean, it's one thing to clean one crop, but when you're throwing two of them together, then you kind of got to have a specialty equipment and be, be set up to do it yourself. Yeah, and maybe Scott here would be a good time for you to Maybe talk about from a buyer's standpoint, what kind of things are you looking for in the end market? A lot of these guys talk about cleaning seed. What are you looking for as a, as a contract buyer for these crops? Well, yeah, that's probably one of the biggest changes guys will have to go from general commodities. You know, if you, you raise corn or soybeans or wheat and you have a little bit of weed dockage in it, it's usually not a big deal if you're just taking it into the elevator. Some of the noxious weeds can be fine in your state, but they're not in another state. So it's pretty tight tolerances. It is a different world you're, you're working in. And it's something you need to be aware of, definitely, when you're raising these crops, that you know it might be fine in your area, but if you're selling it in the seed market, you gotta know what the other states are. And some of the tolerances are really tight, if there's a tolerance at all, some of it's zero. And so to be able to get to that tolerance level, it, it's definitely a different world than most guys are used to growing a general commodity crop because most of the time you can just haul it into the elevator and be done with it. But that's not the way it works in the seed world. Yeah, so that kind of goes into the next question of some of the challenges that people will face with this, especially if it's their first time uh, one of the challenges that people often talk about would be the, the crop insurance side of things. Do any of you, I guess, as growers have anything to say on, on crop insurance or has that not been an issue? I'd say a lot of times we're just going without. Um, and that's not always a bad thing. Um, yeah, you have risk. If you can't afford that risk, you shouldn't do it. Um, but uh, you don't have that expense. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes some of these early spring uh, crops, if you don't have a lot in them, they could just be a cover crop if, if something goes wrong early. So you have some flexibility there. But for the most part, we've, you know, on the specialty crops, you go without the insurance. Um, but hail insurance in almost every case has been available. and I've taken advantage of that. Yeah, I agree. I'm exactly like, like Jordan. Uh, I don't ever insure any of my uh, specialty crops. 
and normally it's a spring crop. I always have a full cover crop that's coming behind it. I can graze with heifers and, and, and whatnot. Uh, um, it's just, uh, it's a low input deal and I have it, you know, uh, yeah, you have to bear the risk, um, but it's uh, never had a problem with having, having no insurance on that stuff. Um, the same way, I don't have insurance on any of that stuff. Um, and I, I think the one thing there is by doing the crop rotation and um, kind of diversifying yourself and having low input, I mean, some of these specialty crops, if, if you're doing continuous crop and, and following something else, you know, you might only be in the, in the crop some seed and, you know, maybe a, a little bit of herbicide or something in your drilling costs. But I think by not having the insurance, it's helped me um, pencil things out more effectively and, and be conscious and, and watch my costs more closely since I do have that risk for that particular crop. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, I think so many times we don't pay as much attention as we should just because of that insurance factor. So thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in the input side of things, can you guys touch on your chemical and fertilizer program? Is there a big difference between that or is it pretty standard? And John, why don't you go ahead and hear him start? Um, the last five years, I've really cut back on things compared to what I was using and compared to what other people are using, um, just by having the rotation and, and doing the soil health principles and, and integrating cover crops. Um, I've been taking a lot of Haney tests on my ground to show me what fertility recommendations I need. And um, like this, this last year, I, I grew up crop of chickpea flax so by trying to get some legumes out there but I was still having a broadleaf in there to keep some residue on my ground to catch some snow but I went I combined that and as soon as I left the field to combine I went right back to rye and some hairy vetch and you know, a Haney test I did this spring um, you know came back and said to grow 45 bushel rye and I didn't put any any fertilizer down with my rye whatsoever and it said I needed 10 pounds of N was all I needed to grow that, you know, a decent rye crop. So I'd, I'd even go out there with the sprayer or anything. I'd, I put no fertility on that rye. And then I just pulled some uh, sap analysis and just kind of like a tissue thing to monitor the plant health. And, you know, it's, it's showing I'm adequate within everything. So I think by taking a systems approach to it, I've kind of, reduced a significant amount of fertilizer and trying to change the crops and, and follow, you know, a low nitrogen crop with a, with a high carbon crop and, and vice versa. You can kind of use nature's way and, and kind of cycle things through the system. Um, as far as uh, herbicides and stuff, it's kind of a tough one because many of this stuff is not on the label. Um, all the specialty stuff. So you kind of got to do your research and you kind of got to look at some of the publications about uh, cover crop. Usually it's the cover crop publications you can find on herbicide tolerances and use that or maybe try and find something similar species on the herbicide label um, and kind of just experience or, or asking someone or, or researching about that. That kind of is a, is a tough one. And, one of the things with growing the inner crops is sometimes you are limited, especially if you're growing totally different, like rye and, and winter peas, you know, you your herbicide options there, once you get that in the ground are pretty much nothing be, unless you want to take out that broadleaf. So um, when I grow the inner crop things, I still try and um, I tailor my program so that I still have a main crop, so I'm I'm still kind of focused. Say like on the rye winter peas, rye is still my main crop, so I kind of tailor my program for that. And if I don't have to end up spraying the winter peas because I got a clean field or something, then then you can add the the benefit of the of the other crop in there. So that that's kind of helped me as well, I guess. 
Jeff, how about you? Uh, yeah, the less rotation I use, the more herbicide I have to use. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously, you know, I learned right away, like on the oats, uh, there is zero tolerance for some things. Nobody wants any wild buckwheat, which we have in our area. Um, so this is the week we have to spray oats for that. Um, I use like Affinity Broad Spec and, and MCPA. Uh, uh, like John was saying, I do have the, the field that I have my rye winter peas on. Um, there's no buckwheat in there. And a, as of now, I got my fingers crossed. I don't see anything that I wouldn't be able to get out with a cleaner. And that, that's another way you look at it. If you have a cleaner, um, will it be able to get that weed out? And then there's certain ones that are tough. Um, I worry about hairy vetch. Maybe I worry too much um, as far as not being able to get it out of some of my seeds. Uh, but so far, like on oats, um, if I spray it now, um, I won't get any hairy vetch seed in my, in my oats. Um, soybeans actually, you know, with, with more rotation, um, a year ago I raised a crop of soybeans with no glyphosate. Um, just used a traditional burn down. Uh, I think it was like Optil, and then and then I went with normal post-emergent herbicides, um, and that was a uh, it was a heavy cover crop the year before, and it was it was winter grazed, it left quite a bit of armor on the soil, and there just there was nothing there to kill the next spring. So it varies, but I, like I said, the less rotation I use, the more I still have to use traditional amounts of herbicide. Yeah, it, it varies so much from crop to crop what we're doing. Um, it's hard to talk about herbicide unless you're talking about a specific situation. Um, but you know what I've found, if you're going into and something where you're intercropping, you have a broadleaf and a grass together, um, some, you know, maybe I'll put oats or something in that that's, you know, just a mono, monoculture before and make sure I have it clean and also have a, a thick residue mat. And then going into, uh, you know, polyculture then, or polycrop, then you really don't have as many weeds, uh, most likely the following year, you know, unless you let something get away. Just um, thinking through those things, you almost have to be one to sometimes three years ahead and you're thinking of how you're going to get to that crop um, if you want to do it without the headaches you can do it and sometimes force it on the system but um, it's a lot less uh, stressful if you're thinking ahead but yeah it, it, there's a lot of there's kind of a learning curve on the on the herbicides and and the residuals of what you might have used a couple of years ago that might you know, show up, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Okay, uh, I'm gonna switch just a little bit. Um, one of the biggest things that we hear about when people are growing things that they don't think about is the, the PVP side of things and the legality of that uh, versus public varieties. Scott, why don't you go ahead and start with this? And if you guys have any other comments, you can go ahead and follow that up. But Scott, talk to us a little bit about PVP. So I wish I had all of the answers for, for PVP. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that I do. Um, what I do know is that if it is protected under the PVP laws, is you cannot grow it and sell it for seed to really anybody. Um, you can grow it typically and reuse it for your own seed. That's kind of the short of it. Finding that actual list has been quite a bit of a challenge we found. Sometimes we're told something's protected, but yet we can't really find it. Um, there definitely doesn't appear to be a super good list that we found anywhere that shows all of that. Um, we think we have found that. So in the standard stuff like the oats and stuff, most of that's pretty, pretty clearly defined. But when you get into the, some, some of the obscure crops that not a lot of people grow, then it gets to be a little more of a question. Um, there's also some stuff involving trademarks on names and stuff to where 
the crop itself may not necessarily be protected, but the name may be. And so there's a lot of gray areas in there. It just takes you know, a lot of research um, and finding those people that have those answers can be a little bit of a challenge sometimes. I've spent quite a bit of time dealing with that and I wish I could say I had all the answers and I definitely don't feel like I do. All right, uh, does anybody else have any, do you guys have any, I guess, thoughts or comments on PVP? Okay. Uh, I guess, um, you know, I work, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, no, go ahead. You know, I work close with the university. Okay. <laughs> I work close with the universities um, and I have no problem with, with helping to fund their research. Um, the way I looked at it, I've been asked to grow stuff that's off of patent and uh, the new stuff has such better quality and yield it, it more than pays for, for the royalties I have to pay back to the university. Uh, Iowa State actually, they, if you don't have a license for their seed, they, it's illegal to even plant your own production back. So. <clears throat> Yeah, it's that those little things like that, what you just said, can be kind of a big deal. And I, you know, I had a, a neighbor find out the hard way, you know, that with Iowa State stuff that you know, he couldn't plant back his own and was planning on it. And he didn't plant them, but but he had um, he had treated seed and everything before he figured it all out. So uh, there, there's just a lot there that you have to know and try not to slip up i guess i would also add that i do know companies are monitoring that and i believe some of the universities are too so don't think that you can you can skirt around it it's a good way to get in trouble we we hear about it every year that somebody somebody's trying to or has sold pvp seed and so it's just i, I if you're going to get into the seed business make sure you know what what you've got into before before you go to selling it. So Scott, I guess from your perspective as a, a buyer, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see growers face? So, you know, first of all, <laughs> try to have a home for it before you put it in the ground. That's that's probably the first thing. The second thing is is when I talk to per, prospective growers is john touched on it is is storage we we about have to have growers that have their own storage it's just too big of a logistical issue to try to bring it straight out of the field to anywhere to get it cleaned um, that's probably one of my first questions to all growers and then the second one is is you know, how comfortable with what we're talking about you wanting to grow are you going to be do you have any experience with this do you have the equipment to grow it to harvest it um, those, those are the, usually the first two questions I ask all growers when, when I talk to them. Um, okay, John, he brought you up there is the storage aspect of things. What was the biggest challenge for you? Was it storage or, I mean, what has been the biggest struggle that you faced? Um, I would say probably just the the lack of knowledge and, and not how, knowing, you know, how things are supposed to look when they're growing or, or what seeding rate you're supposed to use or when you're supposed to combine it or what moisture it's supposed to be that you can store it. I would say just the logistics and the knowledge of the actual uh, crops would be the biggest challenge. Sometimes I just go on Twitter and ask, you know, I just ask a question because there's probably someone out there that's grown it or, or knows more about it than you. So it's just some of that stuff, trying to find someone that can help you out. Usually there's always someone that can help you out and give you a little bit of knowledge about what you're doing, but sometimes it's hard to find those people. Jeff, what's the biggest challenge you faced? Uh, I am thinking about adding some storage, maybe some hopper bottoms. Um, not only do you need multiple storage, but uh, as in oats, it likes to go through a sweat. You have to uh, uh, cool it down 
you know, even if you think it's dry. And it's a chess match when you have the herbicides, just the combination of everything. Um, but you know what? Sometimes the challenge is kind of fun. So. Yeah, so for us, it, you know, we kind of had some older bins that were set up nicely, um, but they're not real great for commodity crops as far as size. So um, we have added some cone bins and things like that and spent money on that uh, since. But, you know, I, uh, the biggest challenge and the toughest thing for us is just these things actually are adding more work um, in times of the year that we didn't use to have that workload. So we haven't been able to eliminate the, the corn and soybean load as far as acres um, completely, you know, so we, we still have a, a big planting push and a big harvest push. Of, um, you know, we're, we're in the combine a long time. We're in, we're in the planter a long time. Um, so it's added work, uh, you know, harvest in the summer, things that we didn't always have to do. Um, so that's something we've had to weigh out, you know, for family time, um, you know, just a, a lot goes into it. I think that's been the biggest challenge. Uh, there's been a lot of fun and like there's a lot of joy in seeing something new growing and, and, you know, had a lot of fun with that. Um, but had, you know, I think in 2017, we had like 10 different crops that we had to keep separate and harvest and you know, at different levels, that might have been we harvested 100 bushels of something up to, you know, our commodity crops, which were, you know, thousands of bushels, but uh, we had 10 different things to manage. And, you know, that that was probably a little too much. So we've scaled it back a little bit and focused on a few things. And um, managing the time and workload has been kind of the, the tough thing for, for me and for our farm. How about for you, John? I thought I answered first. Oh. <laughs> you did. We'll go ahead with Jeff. As far as challenges? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Uh, definitely, it's definitely more work, uh, I guess. Um, don't twiddle, you don't twiddle your thumbs, I guess. So you're learning something new all the time. And I uh, uh, got rid of most of my livestock, but I'm still busy all winter. Um, combination of, you know, cleaning seed and, and finding information on it and, and uh, the marketing part of it. Um, packaging, anything, and you know, and I don't do that much, but it, it, it's, it's time consuming. Um, I, I say I'd rather I I would rather just be a wholesaler and and uh, those retailers earn everything they get. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm going to open it up here to questions. I've got a couple more, but if anybody has any questions here in the chat, um, there was one earlier on uh, from James asked what is everyone using for cleaning equipment scott said uh most of you guys are using clipper seed cleaners or rotary screen cleaners is that correct or i have a really old but a really good cripping and uh i really like it i can fine tune really fine tune it um and i don't know if possibly looking for another one here at some point but that's what i have now I actually have a fairly new uh, bench industries out of Montana um, set up on wheels. So. And I, I have a rotor range just for separating bigs from malls. Um, and then I have, was using a Clipper 27 to do a lot of stuff, super small machine, but if you had some time, it would do the job, or you didn't have a lot of commodity, it would do the job. And now I got a just got a Clipper 298, but it's also a 1958 model. But they they built things back then, so they still work good. <laughs> yeah. 
So, John, you had mentioned that you'd like to go to Twitter when uh, you're looking for some advice because somebody's grown it before. What is the best resource that you guys have used to learn some of the, the tips for growing these crops? Uh, I, sometimes if you read some books, you just search on the internet for some, some old literature, it seems like you can find a, a lot of those, these, these crops or some of these weird ball crops, they were, they were all growing back then and, and they got comments and stuff about them. Uh, the conferences are very helpful if you go to any of those during the winter months because you can find someone that's probably grown it or tried it and then I use Twitter a lot or Facebook. You can just search for a word or search for the crop on Twitter that you're wanting to grow and up will pop all these posts and stuff and then you can find the person maybe that knows what they're talking about. How about you, Jeff? Uh, what was that again? What was the question again? Yeah, your favorite resource. Where do you go when you're trying to oh, find yeah. knowledge for these? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not a Twitter user, so I, uh, I do a lot on the internet. Um, I've always used University of Nebraska um, for a lot of research data and, and growing, growing suggestions. But, you know, now that's expanded all across the country as far as finding information. And there is, if you look hard enough, there is old, old information out there too, you know, um, stuff that's been put on the internet now, how they did companion cropping, you know, a hundred years ago, things like that. Jordan? I've, I've gotten a lot of information from conferences main, mainly, and, um, you know, depending on the crop, sometimes grower meetings, uh, searching the internet, um, things like that. Uh, I think this is, a, I guess, a, a good opportunity to, to say something I wanted to say about green cover. Um, you know, I, I bought my first pea seed from them, I think, in 2009, and they were, um, it was Keith and Brian in a Quonset building, and, um, and it's become something much more than that now, but I think one of the biggest parts of their success has been educating us as farmers, um, those that are interested in cover crops and, and just farmers in general. And I, I've really appreciated that. I've learned things from their fields um, and you know, meeting opportunities that they've had. They've sponsored um, you know, conferences that I've been to and learned a lot at. So that interacting with other um, people networking, networking, finding somebody, whether that's using Twitter, the internet, or a conference, that's been where, where I've learned the most. Yeah, appreciate that. Can I add one thing while I'm thinking about it? Absolutely. One of the way, best ways that you can find, you know, something that might grow good in your area is by doing some of these diverse cover crop cocktails for grazing. Or, or just to have them out there, you know, after a summer harvest, or you can, you know, if you're not sure what you want to even grow, you know, put some of these 20 species mixes out there and see what grows good on your farm and, and what performs, because there'll be a couple things in that mix that, you know, don't do worth a hoot, but there'll be one or two that might shine and you that might, you know, might open your eyes to say, hey, that, that might work pretty well on, on my farm. It's grown really good out there. That's kind of how I've discovered some of these things. Just finding them by accident, I guess. Yeah, and I was not gonna sales pitch or anything, but we do actually have a, a it's called a plot package. And what we did is we took 25 different species and put enough to cover basically a half acre. And we're selling those for $100 basically it's pretty much just at cost for us in order to allow guys to grow different things and see what'll work in their area without having a huge investment. So if they can mm -hmm. put aside a, a half an acre and a hundred bucks and we'll even give that, that money back on credit if you're willing to do a, a field day or something. So that's an excellent way to learn what's going to work in your area and see what works in that climate, your soil type. Um, that kind of brings me to a question here from Steve. 
who's asking what are some alternative seed crop opportunities for northern Oklahoma and southern Kansas and Dale or Scott you guys might have some uh, answers for Steve there. I'll let you go Scott. Oh probably his first one in southern Kansas he's not going to be in favor of all the neighbors but rye is a good one. That's one of the easiest ones to start with, but it makes you real unpopular in wheat country. Um, Triticale would probably be another one. Those would be your main cereals, I think. Then you could start be looking into the mung beans, possibly the non-GMO soybeans, possibly some cowpeas would be another one that you could get in there if you're not already growing those. Those would probably be the easy major bulk cereals or or any seed crop for that matter then after that you just be getting into the more specialized stuff that you'd really have to find a niche market for or okay. a nice forage crop um yeah dale why don't you go ahead and talk about we just got a couple minutes here but um this is alternatives to <laughs> corn and beans why don't you talk a little bit about the, the cattle being an alternative as well? Sure. Um, and, and some of my thought process comes from a conversation I was just having with someone. Uh, They're they saying, oh, corn prices are horrible. Bean prices are horrible. I can't make any money. I still have last year's corn in the bin and, and uh, I hate to sell it. I've got last year's calves because they're ready to sell right during the epidemic and the price crash and I don't want to sell them for this and said well don't plant corn don't plant beans don't sell your calves plant pasture crops and add weight to your calves and that way when all this blows over you've instead of losing money on another acre of corn that and we already have a mountain of corn, another acre of beans, and we already have a mountain of beans. Cut your input cost, plant some pasture crops, and create some biology in your soil. Build your soil fertility up, including some legumes in there, and, and, and make better soil. Add some weight to those cattle. Give your pastures, your perennial pastures a break. And uh, hopefully when all this blows over, you have heavyweight calves to sell instead of lightweight calves to sell. And by grazing, you've cycled all that fertility right back out on your ground instead of shipping it off in a grain truck and selling that grain for not much more than what you paid for the fertilizer in it. And the nice thing about that is about all these different forage crops is have to find the market. The market exists. It's it's on the hoof in your livestock. Yeah. Well, um, we'll probably wrap up here. Before I do that, real quick, I'll give each of each of you a chance here. Um, what's the the best advice you could give to somebody that kind of wants to start? And we'll start here with Jordan. I was just thinking earlier. Maybe not for growing a crop, but just grow something for fun. Uh, you probably have um, some acres or a, a, a couple feet or a, or a plot or something. Grow something you haven't seen before. For fun, you'll always learn something. Uh, that's what I've noticed. Anytime I do something new or try something small scale, big scale, um, I usually have some fun somewhere in there. There might be some pain if I overdo it, um, but you can have some fun. I mean, even throwing throw a pumpkin seed on the edge of your last row of corn or something like that. And uh, just, to, you know, and try to enjoy some of those things because sometimes it's, it's just stressful to do, to, to farm and, and do everything that we have to do. But I think I've, I've just enjoyed and seeing different crops grow. So that's what I'd say is just do something for, grow something for fun. How about you, Jeff? Yeah, I'd say start small. Um, you know, maybe do maybe do a variation of something you've done in the past. Uh, a lot of us in the past have grown grown, you know, spring small grains, and and it's just looking at it different. And 
you know, I forgot to mention before, and then the information is there. Um, and, uh, you know, Jordan is right. I do get a huge amount of information from Dale Strickler and Keith Burns and YouTube and whatever on, on trying some new things. But um, the main thing is, is probably something you're familiar with, but a variation. Okay, Scott. Well, I'm going to touch on a little bit of what everybody else has said so far, but a little bit of a different angle. I love what Jordan said. Try something fun. Um, you mentioned on your sales pitch your your plot deal. That's why I loved Keith went and renamed it and took away the best name. I used to call it the floor mix, but it's the biological primer remix. I love that. It took all the choices out of what you were going to plant. You just threw it out there. You could see what was going to grow. Like John said, you never knew what you might see. Um, I guess I challenge guys on the start small thing though, you know, if what you're doing isn't working, changing isn't going to hurt anything at that point is how I approached it. First year we pulled the trigger on planting rye, we planted 700 acres of it, had never grown it before. In two years we'd completely abandoned wheat. So I guess I always approached it, you know, wheat wasn't working so changing was pretty easy to do. Um, there's a saying out there, I, I think Kit Farrow says it, that it's pretty hard to be above average if you're doing the same thing everybody else is doing. It's a mic drop from Scott. On to John. Um, best advice I would say is just do as much research as you can and try to learn as much as you can from, from other people and other people that have tried it or from green cover. and. You know, usually if you get some advice from someone, they'll give you a name or some somewhere to look to, to find something else. And the more you can educate yourself and the more you can learn about something you want to do or some, making the change, you know, the better your chances are of, of being successful at it are. And I, I think it's also a great idea to, uh, Jordan touched on it about doing something fun. Um, and when I started doing those cover crops and walking out in the fields and, you know, before I didn't realize how, how dead our monocultures and um, our soils and just the nature is out there when you walk into a crop field. But once you start planting the cover crops and some of these different inner crops and you start seeing life return, um, insects, it's just a different feeling when you walk out there, you know, my, wife and kids we go out there and pick cover crop flowers and stuff and it's you know just watch all the butterflies and insects and stuff so um it it is a lot more fun and it's also fun to, to grow some of these different things yeah well thank you guys so much for being a part of this like i said i know you guys are in a really busy time of year so we do appreciate that uh, your willingness to share your experiences and your knowledge um with that, we're gonna probably wrap up. Next week, we're gonna do a webinar on corn interseeding with Keith and Dean Kroll. So we're really excited about that. It's another topic of much interest. So we're excited to talk about that and hopefully get some answers. Thanks again for tuning in and appreciate all you panelists. You guys have a great week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.